So far, we've discussed calorimeters that are open to the air so that they're at constant pressure. The reaction is occurring under one atmosphere of pressure, which is held constant essentially by the Earth's atmosphere. That's one way to do calorimetry, and it leads to one type of heat value, a heat for the process occurring at constant pressure. The heat for the process occurring at constant volume in general is a different value, and we'll come to understand the reasons really why this is in the next section, next series of videos. For the time being, take my word for it that constant pressure and constant volume calorimetry are very different ballgames. And the topic of this video is constant volume calorimetry, which is also known as bomb calorimetry because quite often, especially when we're dealing with exothermic situations, very high pressure build up inside the calorimeter and it, it takes on the character of a bomb, although of course it's well sealed and is, is not going to explode on us. So the idea behind bomb calorimetry is again, we want to use a well insulated vessel to run the reaction so that we can keep a handle on the heat flows, but the reaction vessel is completely sealed and is rigid. And this leads to a situation where the reacting system is held at constant volume. Volume does not change and very large pressure is also used to prevent pressure fluctuations if a, if a gas is generated. And so, for example, we might burn a sample in a very high pressure of oxygen gas, extremely large excess of oxygen gas. And as we saw in the solution calorimetry case in, for example, a coffee cup where we need to account for heat flow to the calorimeter walls, the heat balance here takes account of the idea that we have our reaction system and we have that occurring in solution or in a bath, in a surrounding water bath, and we have the calorimeter walls and any heat flow, for example, out of the reacting components can be absorbed in one of two places, either by the water bath or solution solvent or the calorimeter walls. And there are two heat terms on the right hand side of the heat balance to account for that. And of course the signs are opposite again, because any heat released by the reacting components must be absorbed by either the water or the calorimeter walls. So as a basic, picture of this, say we're dealing with an exothermic reaction, the sample is reacting exothermically, and there are two places the heat released can go, either to the calorimeter walls, which corresponds to this Q-cal term, or to the surrounding water bath here, and this is where the Q-water term comes into play. In essence, we assume that the outer walls of the calorimeter are perfectly insulating, that we either don't need to worry about those, or those are taken into account through some kind of calibration process built into the electronics of the device or something along those lines. The analysis of a bomb calorimetry experiment really hinges on this heat balance. And the same was true for the calorimetry experiments we've seen so far. The heat balance is absolutely key. And what we're going to do very often is expand these terms in terms of a temperature change times a heat capacity or a specific heat times a mass to calculate Q reaction, flipping the sign as needed to make an exothermic reaction's heat of reaction negative and positive for an endothermic reaction. This is probably easiest to understand through an example. So let's imagine that bomb calorimetry apparatus on the previous slide, we put some glucose inside the bomb, 3.12 grams of glucose specifically. And it's burned in a large excess of oxygen at constant volume. And we observe a temperature increase of the calorimeter from 23.8 degrees Celsius initially to 35.6 degrees Celsius at the end of the reaction. The calorimeter contains 775 grams of water and we're going to assume that the water engages in the same temperature increase here. And we also need the heat capacity of the bomb itself, since that Q-cal term is going to need this heat capacity, 893 joules per degree Celsius. And the question is essentially, what is Q reaction? How much heat was produced by the combustion of this glucose sample? Let's draw a quick picture to represent the situation. So we've got our sample of glucose, that's C6H12O6, inside the bomb, and let's put that in a black box to represent our sample. We've got 
Now, two places where heat can flow as that glucose is combusted. We've got the walls of the bomb itself, gonna represent those in red since we represented that heat flow as red in this original figure above. And then we've got the water bath, which surrounds the bomb. And that also serves as a heat sink as the glucose is combusted. So we can have heat flow from the reacting glucose to the water. That's one of the components. And from the reacting glucose to the walls of the bomb. And that's a second component to the heat balance. And so the Q reaction is going to be equal to the negative of two terms here. The purple term is QH2O. And the red term is what we might call Q cal, the flow of heat to the walls of the bomb. So now all we need to do to solve the problem is expand these two terms, QH2O and QCal. To deal with the QH2O term, we can make use of the specific heat of water, the known mass of water, and the known change in temperature. And we can multiply all of this out to find the QH2O term. Now for the QCal term, which we haven't really dealt with before, this is nothing but a heat capacity times temperature calculation. So we know the heat capacity of the calorimeter walls now. It's 893 joules per degree C. Notice the lack of a mass term. It's actually not needed in this heat capacity since all we really care about is how much did that increase in temperature as this reaction took place. And the temperature change is again 11.8 degrees Celsius here. And that is important to include since we need to divide out essentially the, or multiply out, if you will, the degrees C units in the heat capacity. I'll let you calculate out these terms. The first one is about 38,000 joules, and the second one is about 10,000 joules. And so the final result that we end up with here is that Q of reaction is specifically negative 48,800 joules, or if we just push the negative sign through and convert to kilojoules, negative 48.8 kilojoules for the combustion of this 3.12 gram sample of glucose. So it all hinged on the heat balance. The heat balance here has this added element of heat flow to the calorimeter walls, but other than that, it's very similar to what we've seen so far. The last thing I'll say before leaving this series of videos is that this heat Q reaction in a bomb calorimetry situation is fundamentally different from the heat we would obtain if we ran the combustion of glucose under constant pressure. This Q reaction is a constant volume situation. And that corresponds to a change in a particular thermodynamic state function. The heat at constant pressure involves a completely different state function. And we'll really unpack this idea, if it sounds unfamiliar or exotic, we'll really unpack this idea in the next series of videos when we talk about enthalpy. The heat of a reaction at constant pressure simply is the change in enthalpy. And we will see that in very clear terms in the next series of videos and really dig into enthalpy in, in great detail, primarily because it's the easiest to measure. Bomb calorimetry is a pain as suggested by this apparatus right here, right? It just looks expensive, even in the drawing, and it, it was very expensive in real life. Constant pressure calorimetry is much easier, and the enthalpy gives us great insight into structure and dynamics of molecules. So we'll have a lot to say about that in the next series of videos.